Okay, so welcome again, everyone. I'm really happy uh, to see you all here today. Um, I am Guadalupe Alione. I am the student caucus leader for the Non-Religion in a Complex Future project. Uh, today's event, we are in this installment of the Meet the Author series. We will be discussing uh, Dr. Stevens' recent book, Numbers, The Making of Ex-Christian America from Oxford University Press, 2022. Uh, Stephen Bullivant is a professor of theology and sociology of religion at St. Mary's University, UK, and professorial research fellow in theology and sociology at the University of Notre Dame, Australia. His non-religion related book includes the Oxford Handbook of Atheism, co-edited with Michael Roos, 2013, the Oxford Dictionary of Atheism with Lois Lee, 2016, the Cambridge History of Atheism, co-edited with Michael Roos, 2021, and most recently, Numbers, The Making of Ex-Christian America, 2022. So I will leave the floor to Stephen Bulliman to do his presentation. And after that, it will be a Q&A where you can ask questions, make comments, either speaking in the mic or writing them in the comments. I can read them. Uh, so, OK, Stephen, you can go. Well, first of all, um, thank you to the organizers, especially Nathan and Guadalupe. Um, and, and it's nice to see so many people here. Um, including several of my favorite non-religion researchers, um, a number of whom have not only written their own books on this subject, um, either that have come out a couple of years ago or are about to come out in Ryan's case. Um, and uh, so I'm a little humbled to talk about my own uh, uh, inferior effort, frankly, um, at, at basically trying to make sense of this this phenomenon that will be familiar to all of you, I think, um, and that's the rise of the nons in the United States of America. Um, I just want to like show, and again, the, the, the graph itself is not going to be any kind of great uh, revelation to anyone in this um, group. Um, this is taken from the General Social Survey, uh, which begins in 1972, and, you know, single digits of people who say they have no religion in the United States um, right up until kind of the mid late 1990s um, and especially when compared to quasi comparisons not that any country is kind of really comparable to the United States um, but if you look at Canada if you look at Australia if you look at Britain if you look at France if you look at Germany if you look at the Netherlands if you look at Belgium there's certainly a much higher proportion of, of people who say they have no religion um, from decades earlier. And clearly something happens or certain somethings stop happening um, or a combination of both come together somewhere around the mid late 1990s and different survey programs track this this kind of phenomenon at, at slightly different times so gallup and, and the gss are the ones that we have that have a, a good clear run going right back into the past in fact gallup takes us back into the 1940s um but certainly obviously depending on how you ask the question depending on the mode of conducting your surveys whether these are online or by phone or in person we know that we get slightly different uh, proportions um, of people who say they have no religion, depending on, on how you on the, on the methodology. And yet, equally, if you kind of, however it is that you do ask the question, uh, and if you ask it the same way year on year, we see these um, kind of consistent patterns. So, you know, there's certain ones that are always higher, certain ones that are always lower. The GSS is kind of in the middle of the pack. Something seems to happen um, and, 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 and keeps happening. So it's not a, a, a sudden rise. Um, it seems to be something gets triggered in the late 1990s, the mid 1990s, and we keep seeing the rise and the rise and the rise of the norms. Um, so so Nonverts is a book that, is trying to do several things at once. Um, on the one hand, 
it's well first of all it's, it's a book aimed at uh a kind of a, a, a general readership um it, it's an it's an oup monograph but it's in their kind of trade division so it's one of those kind of pop social science books in a sense that's trying to translate what i hope is a kind of a serious foundation of knowledge and theory um but but in a way that's accessible to the interested layperson um how well it does that well that's up to readers to decide um but that's certainly the intention so one of the things it's trying to do is to lay out what it is we mean by the nons you know how social scientists measure um and study and to do some of the work really in translating this great wealth of new research on secularity and non-religiosity over the past 15 20 years we've seen this big upsurge of non-religion studies um, to translate at least some of that to the wider public while also obviously you know adding in my own particular contribution to various theories as to why um the rise of the nons happens what it means yeah and, and kind of what it means for america you know in kind of grand big picture terms um so the book it's mixed methods um we get a fair bit of you know the statistical spine if you like the sort of the skeleton um is is largely based on the general social survey um and and the general social survey mostly around 2018 um because that's when we get a particularly nice set of religion data because it coincides with the ISSP religion module but also um there's uh, 2020 didn't happen uh, for the GSS 2021 was done differently to how the GSS normally gets done um which means that I mean it, you can see it on this graph so the the dark the black diamond is the 2021 gss figures um for the proportion of nons which is a real leap now whether that is a real one or whether that's because of the different methodology we frankly don't know so it's a stuck to 2018. um alongside this kind of statistical skeleton the kind of the real meat the flesh on the bones if you like comes from about 70 interviews that were done um all over well not all over america but New York, Pennsylvania, Illinois, um, Montana, not Montana, uh, Minnesota, Oregon, Florida, uh, Texas, um, Tennessee, um, mostly by me, um, although there were two uh, research assistants who did the Tennessee and the Minnesota studies. And some of those interviews were part of the Understanding Unbelief um, big program that we've been doing in six different countries um although there were about 30 40 of them were kind of in addition to those so and one of the things i really want this is the last thing i don't want to you know um i'd rather get on to talking to you all frankly um than than hearing me talk about the book because i'm i know what's in it and you know i'm a bit bored of hearing about it frankly i'd rather talk to you guys um one of the things the book's trying to do is to both talk about these big picture trends and the if you like the individual micro narratives um you know i think that most of the work that's been done on the rise of the nons has been either looking at big picture lines on graphs and explaining them or has been focused on um individual personal journeys Bill Zuckerman's Faith No More's books is a, is a, per, it's a great example of this. You know, we've got really rich um, individual uh, narratives of, of precisely how this works out in these people's lives. Um, but I also wanted to do justice to what you might call the MISO level of analysis, and that is how different denominational subcultures, if you like, um, denominational worlds, uh, mediates the the big trends um mediates between the big national level trends and how it plays out in the lives of individuals so there's deep dive chapters in the book focusing on ex-mormons focusing on uh ex-mainline protestants um ex-catholics and ex-evangelicals and one of the the big arguments of the book is well first of all that 
one of the important things that we need to remember when we think about the rise of the nons is that the great proportion of America's nons are, are nonverts, are people who were raised with a religious background, often. Again, it depends depending on the background, but you know, certainly um a lot of these people were raised in a quite a seriously religious way. Um uh and the fact that such a high proportion of nons are pretty close, not only to religious commitment in their own lives, but also in their families, um, I think sets apart the American situation. Um, in Britain, for example, you know, we have a large proportion of adult nons, but the vast majority of those are probably a good generation or two or maybe now three away from serious religious commitment um within their own families so you know you might have you might have a devout irish grandmother if you're a catholic but probably your parents um may have had you baptized may have sent you to catholic schools but certainly you know weren't backing it up taking you every sunday and you got a sense that they were mostly doing it to get you into the school and because the irish grandmother would give them a hard time um you know obviously if you're an ex evangelical in america or an ex mormon first generation um then things are a much close bit much more close um and actually it's been a much more dramatic story um both in terms of your own journey but also in terms of current family dynamics and all sorts of things um as to how you got there um so there's a lot more um a lot more heartache frankly and a lot more kind of uh energy if you like that goes into a lot of these stories um so one of the things i wanted to do in the book was just to kind of chart how you know in aggregate catholic non-version looks different to mainline non-version that looks different to mormon or evangelical non-version um and the last chapter of the book is trying to do a bit of a you know what will the future hold futurology um you know it's always a crapshoot really when sociologists predict the future um you know i i have a little go at max faber's predictions of of you know a hundred years ago of what american religion was going to look like pretty soon um that didn't pan out um but certainly you know the the rise of the nuns is going to keep going um uh where it will kind of uh level out um i'm not quite sure but equally, you know, current trends don't last forever. You know, I, you know, I, I, you occasionally see these kind of if present trends continue, you know, America will be a hundred percent non by whenever. It's just that that doesn't happen. Present trends don't work like that. Um, anyway, I'm going to shut up because uh, I'm bored of hearing my voice. Um, but yeah, happy to talk. Okay, that was really interesting. Really great, Stephen. Thank you so much. So now we're going to start the Q&A. Uh, I don't know if um, anyone wants to ask the first question. Do you have any comment? Oh, Ryan, I see your hand up. I will oh, no. leave you to <laughs> it. <laughs> Hi, Ryan. Hey, how are you, Stephen? I'm very well, thank you. It's lovely to talk uh, to you. Yes, lovely to see you again. Um, first, uh, I have to say, your book is way more humorous than anything that I've got coming out. So <laughs> props to you. I love the humor. It really is great. Uh, and second, uh, my apologies. I got to page 92. I was just checking, right? So I've got a lot of stickies in there, but I only got to page 92, so I haven't finished it. So if any of my questions are answered in the end, apologies in advance. But um, I love the book. The book's great. It's very readable, uh, a lot of fun to read, very insightful. Um, but I have a couple of questions that are kind of branching out from obviously the focus being, uh, you know, non-version in the U.S. I'm intrigued by a couple of things. And since you are in the U.K., maybe you can uh, you know, offer some insights here. And we have other people from lots of other countries here. So, so this is kind of fun. Um, my, my first question, and then I'll let others ask other questions, then maybe we'll come back to some of my others. But um, you, you mentioned right at the beginning the timing. Right. So that that figure that you had up shows pretty clearly that like the rise of the nuns happens in the 1990s. Um, 
I think I have an idea for why that started when it did in the US, but the rise of the nuns happens in different countries at different times. And I'm wondering if you have some thoughts on like why it starts earlier in Canada and the UK and Australia than it does in the US. Why were we so late to the game, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm intrigued by that. And I don't know that I've found a really good answer at this point. So hopefully you've got some thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, for, I mean, first of all, um, you're right that it starts much earlier in the UK and elsewhere. I think part of the trouble that we have is that we we don't have the kind of polling data going back long enough to know when it actually does start in the UK. Um, by the Certainly by the time the British Social Attitude Survey starts, which is our GSS equivalent in 1983, you know, the nons are right into the 30, 40 percent. I mean, so it's already high. It seems that it, it's the 60s is a big factor here, although I suspect it was already much higher than it is in America by then. Um, one of the argument that I put forward in the book um, is essentially, and, and actually, if we if we look at the Gallup data, the Gallup data takes us back to the 40s, and it's a not the best question, but we've got it going back. Um, that there, there is a kind of a slight uptick of the nons in the 60s. Um, you know, it's kind of one to two percent, 40s, 50s. It goes up to about seven, eight percent by the early 70s, and then stays there. Now, the argument that I make in the book is that the everything that happens in kind of everything that happens in the 60s, but also everything that comes to fruition of things that had happened earlier. That, so the baby boomers coming of age in the 60s is a classic one, right? And, you know, suburbanization, you know, you don't see the effects of that on the numbers until people are old enough to kind of start ticking their own boxes, if, if that makes sense. So um, my argument is, is that essentially the 60s kind of have the same torrid effect on religiosity in america as elsewhere and you see this in church attendance so the mainline churches start going down catholic attendance certainly starts going down but we don't see we don't see it in identification so one of the arguments i put forward in the book is that if you're looking for something that's obviously different in america it's the cold war and it's not that there is a cold war it's the framing of the cold war because you know we were we were as up to our necks in the Cold War as, as anyone, right? And like, literally, I make this point in the book, like, three miles from my house, you know, I can go and visit a former USAF airbase where there were nuclear weapons pointed at Moscow, right? Um, you know, I had uncles who were posted with American servicemen in Germany, right? So it's not that, that we, we weren't in a Cold War, but we didn't have the framing of it as Christian Europe versus godless communism, right? And also, you know, if you look back to the 1960s or, when, or whenever, you know, 50s earlier, you know, who are the kind of the public non-religious figures? Well, it's people like Bertrand Russell, it's people like A.J. Eyre, it's kind of respectable establishment men, right? In America, it's Madeleine Murray O'Hare, um, who, is, who, who is kind of, you know, now can be kind of celebrated as this kind of feminist pioneering, you know, wild cat icon right uh but at the time and, and this is something i talk about in the book if you look at the how the head you know the headlines are blonde divorcee starts atheist movement you know like uh you know blonde divorcee sues nasa you know blonde divorcee hates america kind of thing um you know this is a woman who tried to defect to uh russia and they wouldn't have her um so i think i think a large part of at least what dampens down the kind of the live option for people of thinking of themselves as having certainly thinking of themselves as being an atheist, but I think more generally of, of being not religious is this uh, identification of being American with being Christian or at least if not Christian, then some other respectable version of, of religion. Um, and what I argue in the book is that, well, by the time that the late nineties comes along, a you've and the vanguard generation of the rise of the nons is, of course, the millennials. So these are the people who were raised either mostly or all after the Cold War. Um, and also it's a generation for whom, you know, suddenly the big American enemy isn't people with no religion. 
is people with too much religion. And, and it then allows, and we see this with the new atheism, the new atheism is very good. Sam Harris makes this point that he write, starts writing the end of faith the, on September 12th, right? Um, you know, Richard Dawkins wanted to advertise the God delusion with, you know, a New York skyline with the Twin Towers and imagine no religion. Um, so, so one of the arguments there is that, that you know, it, it became very easy for this generation, particularly to kind of think, well, actually, maybe religion's the problem. You know, and 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 by this time, especially the mainliners and a good proportion of the Catholics were precisely in this state of, well, you know, I guess we were baptized, but we I'm not sure our, our parents believed, if anything, you know, what they believed, if anything. We only ever really went to church when grandma was in town. So you've got this kind of waned religiosity, which, you know, is kind of, you know. 40 years on from that kind of 60s beginning of church decline. Um, so I think several things kind of come to a head in the late 90s. Also the internet. And, and I, I think particularly if you're from an evangelical subculture or the Mormons and the Mormons cite the internet a lot, then the internet suddenly is, is this kind of other catalyst. So I think several things, I think one big thing stops by the late 90s, which is the Cold War kind of legacy. I think several new things come along um, and I, I, I really do think that once, you know, once you start getting those, you know, rise of the nons headlines by the early 2000s, then people start thinking, oh, I guess that's what I am. Uh, and then you get another, you know, then a couple more and then and then it kind of they get this kind of snowball effect. I th so, I mean, I've basically just given you the, you know, the, the chapter that you're probably about to get to in a couple of pages, Brian. But um, that's 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 the. The, the nearest I've got to, I think, what I, you know, tongue in cheek call a grand unified theory of, of the rise of the dons and, and why it happens when it does and why it didn't happen earlier. Because for me, the big question about American, you know, rise of the nons isn't why it happened. It's why didn't it happen when it did everywhere else? Not everywhere else, but you know what I mean. Awesome. Thank you. Great. So I see Linda also has her hand up. Please go ahead. Gosh, it really is a who's who, isn't it? Hi, Linda. Hello, Stephen. Lovely to see you. Uh, I was just going to jump in on that discussion on, on that whole issue because it's 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 been obviously a lot of debate about it and has been for some time. Um, and two classic books doing that was um, Callum Brown's The Death of Christian Britain, where he saw the 60s as really fundamental. And then Hugh MacLeod's book, The Religious Crisis of the 1960s, yeah. where he he argued very strongly against that and amassed a great deal of evidence to show that the 60s actually wasn't all that significant for religion. So the continuity thesis, that it's just steady decline and actually you've got to look to young people and what's happening to them. And it's just steady diminishment every year versus the, the 60s were some sort of a crisis. Um, um, but every country has a different story. Um, so um, I just noticed um, a minute ago that we had um, Margaret was here from Margaret's there. Hello, Margaret from Denmark. Now, Denmark's different again. Um, so the idea that there is a grand unified theory, um, I'm not sure about. Well, it was my grand unified theory for America. That's, that, that was the unified <laughs> bit. Um, I appreciate that we don't have a grand unified. There theory, are so it? many factors and there are, you know, and if in terms of atheist role models, well, George Eliot, you know, very, very powerful, very influential, extremely popular woman atheist from the mid, mid 19th century. Claire Carlyle's new book on her shows just how important she was and is and how popular. So, um, yeah, it's very complicated. Yeah, no, it is. Um, and I think that I mean, and, and the thing with America is that if you go if you go back, then we get people like Ingersoll or people, you know, there's a much, you know, you. You don't have to go too far back before the picture starts to look very different. But then, I, I mean, I, I do think that the um, the 1960s, but but the, but not so much, not necessarily just the 60s themselves, but the coming age of the baby boomers is significant. Um, and and certainly it's significant in Britain, certainly it's significant in America, whether it's significant elsewhere, I don't know. But I I also read Hugh McLeod's book um, and I. Maybe I need to reread it, and I badly read it, but I that was, that's not quite how I remember the argument going. I mean, my my 
my takeaway was that the 60s are very important um, for understanding religious decline in Britain. Um, that was certainly my reading of the McLeod book. Um, yeah. Religious change, yes, but, well, well, well we, can, we can correspond about this. <laughs> like my viva again, this Linda. Okay, that was interesting. Joel, I seen your hand up. Hey, Stephen, great to finally meet you and uh, look forward to hopefully in person at some point. Yeah, too. Um, uh, I just received your book this week, so I haven't started reading. Uh, so you might just answer my question by saying read the book and come back to me in a month. But uh, I'm, uh, I was curious by your statement about this uh, meso level kind of organizational response, both to the macro and micro. Um, and wondering if, if you could provide us maybe with a bit of a teaser on uh, either a central argument there, or maybe it's so varied based on the group. Um, you want to comment maybe in Catholics in your own context or yep. what have you on how they're kind of navigating those uh, micro and macro level. Uh, yeah, sure. Well, I mean that uh, that that idea emerged out of uh, an earlier book project called Mass Exodus, which is particularly looking at Catholics in Britain and America, and you know why the decline happens. Um, when it does and, and how it plays out differently, but similarly in both contexts. And, and one of the arguments there was I was trying to um, engage with two literatures. One is a Catholic specific literature, um, which is very Vatican II focused, either positively or negatively, right? Um, and, and then there's this kind of completely, you know, a Catholic literature, you know, the classic, you know, the classic works by people like Grace Davy, people like Linda Woodhead, people like Steve Bruce, people like Callum Brown, people like Hugh McLeod, who may well talk about, well, there's a there's a Catholic sub story to tell, but it it, it is a sub story of a of, of a general story. Um, and, and I in Mass Exodus, I wanted to argue that there's actually, yes, the you know, the 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 bigger things going on in the society are, you know playing out in, in the Catholic world too, but there's a, there's a particular Catholic story to tell. Um, it's not just kind of a, um, a, you know, an outworking of of, of the general uh, kind of secularization narrative or, or how, we, or, or religious transformation narrative or how we want to frame it, um, but with, you know, sort of funnier hats or something like that, right? Um, and then out of that, when it came to kind of think about nonverts, it struck me that, well, given that how Catholic Catholic decline is, um, surely, you know, uh, being an evangelical or being Mormon or being, uh, you know, a congregationalist or whatever, you know, North Northeast congregationalist or Presbyterian, um, well, not only the the kinds of factors that come into play in the the non version of that group, but also the the kind of non verts that it produces. Because one of the arguments, and there's been a that since I wrote the book, and so while I was writing the book, we're starting to get these psychological studies about religious residue effects. So the idea is that, and it makes perfect sense, is that you know. People who were raised Catholic who are now nuns um, are, on average, you know, different to people who are now nuns who were raised as nuns or raised as Muslims or raised as other types of things. OK, which, which kind of makes sense. Right. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to do with this book was to say that, well, look, if you talk to. You talk to ex-Mormons, then, you know, obviously every story is going to be different. But there's going to be a certain commonality of, you know, story. There's going to be different kind of standard deviation of the kind of things that are big factors for them. There's kind of kind of things that just aren't mentioned. Um, and and it makes sense to tell uh, an ex-Mormon story um, as its own thing. Likewise, it makes sense to kind of really do a kind of a, a deep dive, especially for the terms of the book, into understanding, you know, where ex-evangelical nuns are kind of coming from. And again, if you talk, you know, talking to them, you know, they'd be raising the, either the, exactly the same kinds of issues or very similar sorts of issues. So, it, you know, it was palpable that, you know, the, the kinds of experience of being a, a non-vert, you know, 
having been raised in you know southern baptist church in in rural texas you know is going to be very different to being raised in you know a episcopalian church in in pittsburgh um and i wanted to kind of tease that out a, a bit more in the book and it also allowed me to kind of especially um it allowed me to uh it allowed me to engage actually with the kind of the the denominational literature, you know, the kind of the particular literature that we get on each of these phenomena, phenomena, you know, on on this phenomenon coming from a Mormon perspective, coming from an evangelical perspective, coming from a, a Catholic perspective. So yeah, that's really what what that miso level kind of idea is about. Is that you know, yes, nuns are on the rise across certainly all of those four groups, but a, the rates are very different. The timing's different, um, and and kind of how it's all played out and how it feels for the people involved is is very different. That's great. Thanks, Stephen. Looking forward to uh, to the read and interacting further. Any other question or comment, Ryan? Please go ahead. Sorry, I. I don't know. I always take like when people have lots of questions, that's a good sign that like they engaged with what you're doing. So and I don't want to take away from anybody else. So if anybody else has questions, please jump in. Um, again, I'm going to kind of this like international comparison stuff. Uh, obviously, there's research, right? Looking at people leaving religion in lots of different countries. But uh, your dive is a deep dive into the U.S., what it's like to leave. And you kind of, you know, I, I like the idea of like meso level stuff. You're looking at den denominational differences. Maybe this is slightly more macro. I think it's still probably meso. But do you think what it's like to leave religion in the U.S. is radically different from what it's like to leave religion in, say, the U.K. or in Argentina or Brazil? And you may not be able to answer the question like Argentina. Guada might be better situated to answer that question. But but do you think there are meaningful differences to like leaving religion in the U.S. versus the U.K. at this point? Or is it basically the same thing? I think there's a lot less religion to leave in the U.K. So it's it's far rarer in the UK, for example, to find people for whom becoming not religious and not getting their kids, taking their kids to church, that, you know, this has been and is to this day a massive open wound with their families um, or that they had a period where their mother didn't talk to them or they didn't talk to their mother, you know, that they kind of had to cut the family off or that it's always awkward at uh, family gatherings um or you know like i'm not saying there aren't pockets and you know different you know if i mean i certainly know that there are areas of british religion where something much more like that is going to be um in play but it's not going to be as big a part of the the pie, if you like, the apple pie, um, as when you look at American religion. You know, like if, if you're talking to people who were raised evangelical or raised Mormon, then this has to be a big deal. OK, um, you know, this is a, you know, a real source of kind of uh, heartache or trauma or anger or something um, for them now because it's a big deal in the families. Um, and it's much, you know, this is, you know, one of the things, you know, one of the things I cite in the book is this, you know, that, you know, Linda's written about this, you know, that kind of the the norm in Britain is, is no religion. You know, we've had this kind of mainstreaming, which going on for a long time, but there's a sense in Britain now in which the default is not to be religious, unless you have a particular reason to kind of opt in. Um, and, in America, again, it's changing, but it, it's flipped. Now, obviously, that depends on where you are in the country. It depends on which denomination you were raised in. It depends on how old you are. It depends on all sorts of things. Um, but the kind of the background level of religiosity, kind of that makes sense, kind of is much higher. Um, again, America's a big country, but, you know, both 
generally, but also, you know, if you're raised in Alabama, even if you're raised kind of vaguely not religious in Alabama, there's a lot of, re- you know, you're not your family not being religious or you not being religious is a thing. Um, and it's something that you are aware of in a way that um, it's it's the other way around in Britain. Um, so I think that does play a, a large part. Now, obviously, that's different. If you're raised in kind of Portland, Oregon, it's going to be very different. OK, it's going to be. But um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that. That we we just don't have that in, in Britain anymore. Um, so I think that's the, the, the big difference um, in, in between Britain and America in kind of very big terms. Uh, just a quick follow up on that. So and, and I think that makes perfect sense. I'm, I'm wondering, like, if we can step back a little bit, is that because religion has been on the decline in the uk like openly right like clearly for a lot longer than in the us or do you think there's something substantively different about the cultures of the two countries and those may not be mutually exclusive right they they may be one and the same thing that like the long-term decline of religion in the uk has led to a, a different culture and so it's perfectly fine or is it one of the two? Uh, and I, I don't know. I'm just I'm, I'm wrestling with this idea of like why is it so different? Yeah, I mean, I think that the cultures are different, and uh, but equally within America, the cultures are very different. Okay, so and and it, you know, north south in Britain or you know Scotland Wales, you know, the, the, there is a different kind of feel to these places. Um, I mean, I don't think there's any necessarily any kind of quint. I mean, the other thing to say about Britain and America is that actually culturally we are so very similar and this is you know one of the one of the things i wanted to do in the 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 previous one of the previous books mass exodus was to say that we we tend to think of britain and america as 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 contrast religious in you know the kind of christian america versus godless europe kind of classic um you know sociology of religion contrast and one of the arguments i wanted to make in mass exodus is like well there are obvious differences but you know we share an awful lot you know, not just in terms of pop culture, but, you know, of his language and history. Um, but, you know, there's a there's a there's a lot that's shared culturally speaking. Um, now. I, I so I, I think there's more to it than just that. Well, I, what I don't want to say is that, well, the reason the difference is that, you know, Britain is just 40 years further down the road because I think they're different roads. Um, you know, this is one of the points that I make, you know, going back to Weber um, towards the end of the book. Like, you know, when I say that America is getting more non-religious, I, you know, and what I'm not saying is that it's kind of Europeanizing um, because A, Europe's very diverse. Um, America's very diverse. You know, there's bits of America that, you know, are, you know, more secular than, you know, large swathes of even Western Europe, you know, like church going in. Uh, Colorado is probably about the same level as it is in Sweden. I mean, like, it's not, you know, we can't draw those kind of national level, regional level kind of um, clear comparisons. Um, But that's not to say that, you know, um, America can't secularize in its own way. Um, You know, I draw on that that kind of multiple modernity stuff that that Grace Davey, you know, talks about is, 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 I think, very important here is that, you know, Weber thinks that, well, you know, uh, America, you can see the he talks about it as Europeanization that you can see that you know American religion is very strong, but you can already see the cracks forming, and pretty soon you'll be just like um, Europe is. You know, and the idea that America is going to take its kind of cultural cues from from Europe during the twentieth century is just <laughs> in retrospect madness. Um, so I, I think that you know America is going to continue being um, interesting in its own terms, shall we say, for some time to come. That, that was, was an awfully rambling answer, I'm afraid. No, 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 not at all. It was a great conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any other comment or question? Nathan, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, uh, Stephen. Really, really fascinating uh, discussion. Um, I had kind of a, a meta question, and I was sort of uh, going on a tangent off your, you mentioning like, your book is aimed somewhat at a more general audience. And I wonder how well you think the kind of general population understands like what's happening with religion. Like for example, if you asked people, you know, what percentage of people do you think identify as Christian or identify as none? 
um, would they would they have a good sense of those numbers? And I my my hypothesis might be, you know, perhaps more conservative Christians might overestimate the number of nuns, for example, and maybe I don't know what set, like, what, what uh, secular people would do if they would if they would overestimate. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I just wonder if you have any ideas about that. Yeah, no, it's a really interesting question. I always do this with my uh, my own students, my own undergraduates. Um, you know, I ask them, you know, what, you know, this given this question from the British Social Attitude Survey is worded in a particular way. You know, what kind of proportions would you guess, you know, that the British adult population answers this in? Um, and 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 there's just, you know, these are you know people very interested in interested enough, shall I say, to be doing theology and religious studies right and the proportions that they come up are just like wildly like uh all over the place um and and they always vastly overestimate the number of muslims right they always assume that there must be about more well, it must be about 30 percent. maybe that's just where from where they're from right then you know given where they are and we are we're in west london that might be like just based on you know their friends or the people they went to school with but also i think it, you know you hear about muslims a lot in the press you know and you know that's in, in a way that you don't hear about uh you know i don't know any other religious group as as much maybe the c of e but probably not there's this sense that there's all you know the vast growth of islam and there is you know from kind of two percent to five percent or something you know over the past however many decades but you know it's not you know this kind of looming 40 percent or something that you know you get from certain newspapers so i i mean i think that the kind of those, those perceptions are uh you know in sociologically interesting in themselves right um i mean i think you're right i mean i think you know one of the thing you know certainly when you you know you when you write the pitch to the publishers is about why this book is going to sell lots of copies um and you know, one of the arguments was is that well, obviously, hopefully, this this is a book that will appeal to at least some nonverts, and there's certainly lots of that. You know, there's millions of that, right? They hopefully they'll find this relatable, and and actually, if you re there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, um, leaving religion best selling uh, you know autobiographies right out there. Okay. And it's often like I left, I left the the FLDS, or you know, I left uh, the Haredi Judaism, or something like that, right? Uh, left the Westboro Baptist Church, or whatever. Recent one I read. Um, so you know, there's clearly, you know, clearly some people find this, uh, you know, leaving religion as as relatable. Um, so the argument there is that well, there's a certain proportion of people who are themselves nons and might be interested in, you know, the topic, but also, and I think an important part of that market is religious people. Um, who are either worried or concerned or interested, either kind of on mission grounds, but also because it's their own family members. I mean, this is one of the arguments of the book is that there's an awful, there's a huge, actually, there's a huge evangelical subgenre of books on prodigals, right? There's a whole, I didn't, wasn't aware of this at all. Um, you know, praying your prodigal back home, you know, uh, uh, help I have a prodigal I mean like these are literal titles of books I've not read them but you know and and um and, and obvious and it's interesting how how the, the framing of, of prodigal obviously is quite hopeful um but obviously there's uh you know this this is a topic that's very real and raw you know for people on both sides you know from for, for the prodigals and and you know for their mothers essentially um so i mean what proportion of those people have an accurate i mean i guess america is very well served you know if if you do if you are a casual uh consumer of religious media then you know pew do a very good job you know so i guess of all the countries in the world you know americans might at least have the resources there very easily to to get a good sense of some of these um things but i mean i think you know people do have a sense that nons are on the rise um you know um so yeah but no i mean you know it's, it's kind, of, kind of thing with any kind of academic subspecial and you actually what people actually know um fairly small but you know then again i think well you know if people ask me you know questions about very basic stuff about things i kind of think i know something about um i'd be uh kind of um tripped up pretty easily i suspect if i know so yeah 
Thanks for that, Stephen. There is a question in the chat from Lucy. Hi all, I'm wondering if Stephen had a specific motivation for looking at numbers in America, and is there a reason why there, there is a lack of research for this phenomena outside the US and Europe? I'm in a quiet space, so I can't read out my question. Thanks, oh, don't worry, Lucy. Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. So the reason I was interested in uh, America is two reasons. Firstly, I'm, I guess I'm a scholar of American religion. Um, so. Um, partly because of my Catholic interests I've worked on America in the past, but also it's very easy as a sociologist of religion to feel like you know something about America because so much of the center of gravity of the field, so much of the theory, so much of the sort of the, the work and the top scholars and, you know, are either from or, and at least in part writing about the American context, I say. And we hear a lot about America in the news, um, including the religious stories. So, you know, it, it's a kind of an easy subject area to lean into. Okay. So, um, and plus this particular reason is that, well, American nons is, is very interesting, right? It's suddenly done, it's suddenly done something um, uh, noteworthy uh, that kind of uh, needs answering. So there's no, there, there's kind of like no, um, the reason why, uh the american uh rise of the nons is one of the ones that there's a lot of literature about isn't isn't sociologically surprising shall we say likewise western europe um you know if you look at at least in the anglophone scholarship but where the center of gravity of you know the fields are of the social sciences um and you know going back to people like weber and durkheim and you know these were western european scholars and and therefore it's not a surprise that we have a disproportionate amount of literature on these areas. Um, I think one of the big things that we're trying to do in non-religion studies, um, and I mean, this is a small, it's a small and, well, it's certainly a, a growing, it's not that small anymore, um, but, you know, it, it's only kind of 15 years, maybe it's slightly more now, that there was almost no sociology of non-religion and atheism out there. I mean, I, I remember when I did my, first doctorate in theology on the theology of atheism and I wanted to read up you know what is there on the sociology of the topic and you know I it's, well, there, there wasn't none but I could read it all you know I felt like I kind of I exhaustively dug out everything that had been written in English at least and you know um, now it's just not possible to do that and and I think one of the things that we have been trying to do as a field um, is to to bring in other people not only working on outside of that world, but coming from outside of that, you know, Euro-American world. Um, and and so, you know, the the Understanding Unbelief project that I've been involved with and, and its successor explaining atheism, that's something we've specifically been interested in doing. And then there's all sorts of fascinating work from all over. But this is something that's very kind of been a, a kind of a real personal thing for me is, you know, if you have to edit a book called The Oxford Handbook of Atheism, or if you have to edit a two volume Cambridge history of atheism, you're painfully aware of the lack of coverage of certain, you know, you know, continents, you know, let alone countries um, or topics. Um, and, you know, you're death, you're thrilled when people, you know, you suddenly find someone who's working on this. Right. And, and so one of the things I'm personally working on a lot at the moment is looking at how uh, non-version and atheism, atheization is playing out in Muslim majority countries, particularly in uh, northern Africa and, and the Middle East. Um, so that's a project I'm working on. And, you know. I'm delighted to see that there's, you know, scholars from those countries working on these topics, but again, you know academic capital is um you know peer-reviewed journals and uh you know um grant money um so it's very easy i think for people and this was true early on in non-religion studies um you know one of the, when it was kind of like you know will it make it kind of as a subfield or will we all have to pretend that we're actually scholars of a different you know subfield that there's a jobs in 
uh, and grant money to be had is there's this kind of thing that well if you you get people working on a particular country who you know is interested in the topic and publishes something but if there's not if that's not something that's recognized by their department by the kind of people who are advertising jobs by you know grant bodies then it's very easy for those people to just like you know move on and work on something where you know there's a career to be had in it and i think we've been very fortunate in non-religion studies that a, a combination of factors um you know have allowed us to kind of you know make a living out of it uh, you know at least at least partly that you know this isn't just a little sideline of stuff we're interested in alongside the, the proper subjects but actually this is like recognized by the 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 academy and therefore our employers and grant making bodies and so yeah there's all sorts of structural issues about about why this is that was great thank you Stephen uh, oh there is a comment from Lucy great answer go. thank Delighted. you Stephen <laughs> um so there is time for one more question or comment Does anybody? I do have one, but I don't want to, no, you know, no, no, take no. the. Okay, because I'm always interesting about the research part of, you know, these the research aspect, and you were talking about the interviews and following, you know, these different experiences from leaving, uh, you know, Catholicism or leaving evangelicalism. You know, and I am interested in the in the interviews you carried out. What were you paying attention? What you know to to be able to carry to 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 take these individual you know trajectories of life. I I am really interested about how do you carry out these interviews. Yeah, sure. So there was two, two kind of two main ways of interviewing. One was. I mean, there was an understanding unbelief kind of set. It's very detailed, in-depth, qualitative interview schedule um, that we did in America, Denmark, Britain, Brazil, China, Japan. Um, and so some of those interviews were just part of that, um, which was asking about all sorts of stuff, about uh, worldviews and beliefs and, and, you know, all sorts of stuff, including religious upbringing and, and you know, obviously then, because I was doing those interviews, I could then, you know, get them to expand on things I was particularly interested in for this. Um, but the the non-understanding unbelief interviews was essentially sitting down with people in a, a, a somewhere convenient and, you know, comfortable for them, often a pub or a, a, a cafe, um, and just asking them to, well, you know, let's start at the beginning, you know, tell me tell me your story you know your religious story you know your kind of your non-version narrative let's start at the beginning you're talking about your upbringing and, and so there was no kind of set interview schedule obviously I, there were certain things I was interested in you know and and but it they were if you listen back to those interview transcripts not that you you ever would want to um but they are very conversational um, and, you know, they are very kind of uh, informal, but obviously, you know, I'm the certain topics based on the literature, based on what other, you know, so if, if I'm interviewing, you know, my 12th ex-Mormon, there's certain things based on, you know, the other ones um, that I might want to ask them about to see if it was a feature of their stories or not. So there's things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's a there's probably um if I was uh, writing it up for a you know a JSSR you know article, um you know I'm sure there's a sort of a jargony way of explaining that methodologically you know some uh, you know semi structured uh, you know uh, you know ground up um, schematic or something, uh, but yeah it was it was asking people you know in your own words you know tell me how you went from being a an ex to or not and you know these were often you know these were often an hour an hour and a half you know sometimes two hour kind of very deep, not quite a full uh life history um but you know there wasn't kind of like you know here's six questions i want to have answers to great thanks Stephen, for that so i think we have reached 
the end of this Meet the Author. Um, I want to thank again to Stephen for this super interesting presentation and the discussion that we led here today. It was super interesting. So thank you for the people who made comments and asked questions. And Nathan, I will leave you to give the information for next events. Uh, and thank you again, Stephen. Pleasure. Oh, Timu's next. Oh, it's great. Yeah, um, I just uh, included in the in the chat uh, the link to register for the next event uh, with uh, Timu Tara, who um, he's going to be talking about his new, well, I guess it came out last year, um, his book, uh, Atheism in Five Minutes. Um, so so the, the link to register is there. I also included a link uh, for our mailing list so you can sign up if you want to receive um, info about any future events, future research uh, from the NCF project. Um, otherwise, uh, thanks again, everyone, for coming. And thanks, Stephen. It's a really fascinating uh, discussion. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye, everyone.